This lecture is on expertise, and in this lecture I want to cover uh, three topics. The first is what is an expert, so we're going to define expertise. Uh, the second is how do you get to be an expert? Uh, and the third is how do experts differ from novices in terms of cognitive processes? Uh, so what is an expert? Let's start with a definition uh, from uh, Anders Ericsson. Uh, and Ericsson uh, is arguably one of the experts on expertise. Uh, and he suggests that real expertise must pass three tests. Uh, first, it must lead to performance that's consistently superior than that of the expert's peers. I've highlighted consistently superior, or bolded it, uh, to emphasize that as the first, uh, uh, first part. Second, real expertise produces concrete results. Brain surgeons, for example, not only must be skillful with their scalpels, but also must have successful outcomes with their patients. A chess player must be able to win matches in tournaments. And finally, true expertise can be replicated and measured in the lab. In other words, it's something that's consistent, it's something that's concrete, and it's something that we should be able to measure and study. So, concretely, what is an expert? Uh, experts know how to solve new problems. We just had a unit uh, on problem solving. Uh, and we talked a little bit about different approaches to problem solving, different heuristics and different algorithms, different ways to change representations. Experts have a set of skills uh, for solving new problems. And for problems that are ill-defined or ill-formed, the expert can find operations to apply to new problems. They're better at searching for heuristics. They're better at searching for shortcuts. And remember that heuristics depend on background knowledge. Uh, heuristics de depend on knowledge around the situation and being able to be aware of the context in which the problem is stated. So if you've been solving a certain kind of problem uh, for a long time, for many years, uh, you're going to get better at it. You're going to have a lot more knowledge. You're going to have a more densely connected semantic network of information that lets you use your heur heuristics more effectively and, and correctly. Um, the expert also just knows the answer to familiar problems. One of the things that's uh, clear about experts is that they can retrieve solutions from memory. Again, this is a heuristic, uh, and it's a heuristic that depends on a fairly rich semantic network. So if you've got a lot of prior experience, you don't need to start solving from the beginning. Uh, you don't need to uh, cycle through a bunch of those general problem-solving heuristics because you have specific information about the context. Uh, so. You're going to be able to solve those problems more effectively uh, and likely more correctly. So how do you get to be an expert? Or this is sort of a transition from what is an expert to how do you get to be an expert. And one is that you've put in about 10,000 hours uh, developing your expertise. And this has come to be known as the 10,000 hour rule. Uh, and this comes from Erickson's work. But as we're going to see over the next uh, few minutes, uh, it's not really a rule. Uh, it's kind of come to be regarded as a rule, which is why I put it in quotes, uh, but it's definitely not a rule. Uh, it's a guideline, and it seems to be an average finding. What it's not uh, is a set of um, sufficient characteristics. Uh, it isn't the case that you need uh, always 10,000 hours, or that 10,000 hours would be sufficient. You work at something for 10,000 hours or 10 years, and you're an expert. It's not the case. Um, and that does seem to be the way it's been interpreted or incorrectly interpreted uh, in the literature. Here's what Erickson found. We're going to look at uh, Erickson's original paper that developed this idea in the mid-90s. Um, essentially, what they found is that musicians, so they studied expert musicians, with the highest level of achievement, and these would be people who would go on uh, to be professional musicians in symphony orchestras. Uh, now, you may or may not uh, listen to Western classical music, um, but it takes a long time to develop the amount of expertise uh, with your instrument such that you would be able to play professionally uh, in you know, one of the premier uh, symphony orchestras. And you can imagine that kind of expertise applying to lots of different domains that require time and talent and practice, all of those together. They found that musicians with the highest level of achievement were those who were likely to have spent close to 20 hours or more per week over about a 10-year period to deliberate and focused practice of their instrument. And that's a key thing, deliberate and focused. So this isn't just spending 20 hours a week on your instrument. This is 20 hours in a, a week with a specific goal to get better. So what they did um, is they looked at this theoretical framework, and they suggested there are kind of three stages of expertise 
um, in which they suggest that uh, there's a combination of innate talent, um, but what used to be believed as primarily innate talent is actually the result of intensive practice uh, for about a minimum of 10 years to achieve a level of what people would consider expertise. Uh, and again, this is specific to music in this case, but it generalizes to other fields. Um, and so across these three stages, uh, they suggest that there's sort of an initial stage where maybe you try out different instruments. There's a stage at which your performance uh, begins to increase after this, uh, after selecting an instrument you want to work on, uh, and then you have to maintain that level of expertise. In other words, even after the 10 years or 10,000 hours, you need to continue to want to improve. Uh, otherwise, you'll enter into a stage which they refer to as arrested development. You're good, but you never develop the expertise to be good enough to be an expert. Here's how they came about uh, de you know, designing this, uh, this theory. So here's exactly what they did. Um, so in one experiment, or one study, uh, they looked at uh, violinists. Uh, so these are people who were, as you can see, the music professors of the Music Academy of West Berlin, um, nominated violin students who had the potential for careers as international soloists. So these would be the best violinists in an academy that's already selecting some of the best people. So these would be the best of the best of the best. Out of 14 students nominated, three were not fluent in German, one was pregnant, so they weren't able to participate in the entire study. They looked at 10, uh, and they are the best violinists. The music professors also nominated good violinists. Um, and then selected uh, students of the same number, 10, who are specializing in violin education. So in other words, we've now got four groups. We've got professional violinists, as you can see at the bottom. So these are people who are already uh, performing as professionals. You've got the best violinists nominated by the professors on potential. You've got good violinists, and you've got people who are practicing the violin, but not with the intention to become soloists, but rather with the intention to become music edu educators. It's a different curriculum. You become an expert in a different way. Um, and then they studied these particular subjects, the 10 students uh, who were the best, the 10 good, uh, the 10 professionals, and the 10 teachers. Uh, and they looked to see how much practice they had had over the course of their uh, career. Uh, so they interviewed them. Uh, and they asked them to report on how much did you practice during this year? How much did you practice during this year? Now look back through your records. So it was a long investigative um, sort of journaling type study. What they found on figure eight and figure nine sort of shows uh, this trajectory. So when they started, uh, these people started around age five uh, and they were currently at, at around age 20 uh, on average. Um, and the experts looked back during the time when they were age five uh, to age 20. So the professionals also looked back during that time course. So during the time when you begin violin and maybe uh, just about finish with your uh, university level education in violin, how much were you practicing uh, on average each week? Uh, and as you can see, estimated amounts of weekly practice uh, hours. So the estimated amount of time for practice alone with the violin um, increased for these groups, uh, but it only increased uh, for the uh, professionals, the goods, and the bests. Uh, the people who were looking at uh, teaching uh, tended to spend less time uh, on average per week with practice, and that makes sense because music, music educators would be learning other things, uh, learning different instruments, learning pedagogy, uh, and learning other aspects of music beyond just performance. And so their group, as you can see, uh, on average, they weren't spending as much time uh, per week, whereas uh, the other groups are spending 20 to 30 hours a week uh, just practicing to get good. What you can see in figure 9 uh, is where this 10,000-hour uh, idea came from. So if you average out, you know, take these averages, rather, uh, of the weekly practice each week, uh, and then you think about how much time uh, they've spent practicing by the time they get to age 20, uh, it suggests that over this uh, roughly uh, 10 to 12 year period, uh, the best violinists, those that were uh, flagged as the best by their professor professors, and those that were already uh, currently outstanding violinists in symphony orchestras, had accumulated around 10,000 hours of dedicated, deliberate practice 
uh, by the time they entered their professional career. And you can see those are the two lines that are at the top. Those that were nominated as being good uh, by the time they were age 20 uh, had accumulated fewer. They were about 2,000 hours behind, right? So they're about 8,000 hours. In other words, unbeknownst to the professors who nominated the good and the best, uh, when you interview the people that were nominated as good and best and then ask them how much time did they spend practicing, uh, the best people, it turns out, they say that they practiced more. Uh, and if we take them at their word, they've been putting in more time. Uh, and it seems like practice pays off, right? The more time they've practiced, the better they are recognized. They're either professional or they're recognized as being the potential uh, for being professionals. You can see that the uh, music educators, the teachers, uh, are the lowest line. Uh, by the time they're ready to launch their professional careers, they've only been practicing about uh, four to 5,000 hours, so uh, less than half that what the best uh, and the professionals have been doing. Uh, and it's not because they're uh, not good in their profession. They're training for a different profession. So it makes sense that they would spend less time dedicated to violin practice because they need to spend more time dedicated to becoming perhaps expertise, experts in uh, education. Uh, so it's a different uh, program. But that's where this idea came from. And they showed it with other domains, for example. Uh, here are piano players reporting the same thing, experts and amateurs, expert pianists uh, reporting by the time they launch their professional careers. They've estimated uh, how much time they practiced each week uh, from age 4 to age 20, and they've put in about 10,000 hours. And they found this for other domains, and in this same paper, uh, they looked at uh, people who were uh, experts in physical domains as well, uh, so athletes. Uh, and this seems to show up along a lot of different uh, kinds of expertise that uh, in order to become a professional expert in something, uh, one of the characteristics seems to be that you've spent uh, around uh, 20 hours a week on average uh, and that that adds up to around 10,000 hours over this 10 uh, to 12 year period. So it varies and this is a finding, not a rule. This is the outcome of an in investigation uh, rather than a prescriptive rule. So why does this seem to be, um, why did I suggest this might not be true? Um, well, it's become sort of a meme almost, uh, and partially responsible for this meme uh, is the 2008 book by the writer uh, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, who's a great writer, uh, and I really enjoy reading some of his material. Uh, I like his podcast, um, and he talked about, in his book called Outliers, uh, people who became exceptionally good uh, at what they do, um, and noticed that in addition to talent, uh, they also had the opportunity, uh, so he emphasized that they had this opportunity uh, to put a lot of extra time in. So whether it's Bill Gates, uh, who uh, because of his location and the time and the place happened to have a lot of access uh, to the uh, University of Washington's computing system uh, as a teenager, uh, which most people wouldn't have access to. Uh, he had access to this and was able to, based on his interests and his the availability, get really good uh, at coding early on. So long before he became CEO, long before he became a philanthropist and everything else, uh, Bill Gates wrote software uh, and literally did uh, a lot of the coding for the original uh, Microsoft um, products. Uh, the Beatles, uh, for example, who, uh, you know, despite their uh, being a fairly short-lived band in the 1960s, uh, you know, went on to be one of the most influential uh, music artists uh, in at least the sort of rock and roll uh, genre. Um, had lots of time to practice long before they recorded their first albums, long before they became uh, famous. They put in a lot of time. And you'll find this is true for a lot of performers, right? There's a lot of performers out there who spend a lot of time. But again, it doesn't mean that there's uh, any... In doesn't mean that it's incorrect that you need to put time in. What it means is that it's not uh, just a rule. Uh, Gladwell essentially named it the 10,000-hour rule, uh, and this sort of uh, went counter to Erickson's finding that it seemed to be, on average, uh, 10,000 uh, hours of practice was one of the components of musical expertise or professional expertise. Uh, and so you can see Gladwell's quote, the 10,000 hours rule says that if you look at any kind of cognitively complex field, so he's generalizing here uh, to make it sort of a, you know, a rule uh, and to make it a rule that applies across all sorts of fields. From chess to neurosurgeon, we see an incredibly 
consistent pattern that you cannot be good unless you practice for 10,000 hours, which is roughly 10 years, uh, if you think about four hours a day. Um, again, this is not counter to Erickson's work, uh, but it's an oversimplification and a generalization. And it's become memed with uh, uh, songs like Macklemore, which I know from your current uh, cohort, uh, you probably cringe if you were once a Macklemore fan. Uh, but you remember this song from a few years ago, right? The 10,000 hours rule. So he name checks Malcolm Gladwell, David Bowie, and Kanye and talks about spending 10,000 hours uh, getting good at doing something and 10,000 uh, kinds of influences and so on. Not necessarily a bad song, uh, but an oversimplification of Gladwell's uh, 10,000 hour rule, which in and of itself is an oversimplification of what Erickson originally found. In other words, it might not be true. Uh, Erickson said this back in 1993 right away, the belief that a sufficient amount of expertise or practice, that is 10,000 hours, leads to maximal performance appears incorrect. In other words, it's not meant to be sufficient. And he wrote later on in a, uh, in a, a follow-up paper, the 10,000 hour rule was invented by Malcolm Gladwell, who stated that researchers have settled on what they believe is the magic number for true expertise. Gladwell cited our research on expert musicians as a stimulus for his provocative generalization to a magical number. Uh, Erickson then pointed out that 10,000 was an average and that many of the best musicians in his study accumulated fewer, substantially fewer, hours of practice. He underlined also the quality of practice was important. Erickson has always emphasized deliberate practice. Um, let's talk a little bit about deliberate practice because that also seems to have some variability. Um, even going beyond Erickson and Gladwell's uh, contention, uh, there's a suggestion that the kind of practice, that is to say deliberate practice, might be more beneficial for some kinds of expertise than others. And let's look at a meta-analysis uh, that was carried out by Brooke McNamara um, at, uh, uh, at, at Princeton University. So Brooke McNamara, uh, who was at Princeton University when this work was carried out, currently at Case Western uh, Reserve University uh, in Cleveland, um, looked at some meta-analyses across the expertise literature uh, and determined that it isn't quite the case, uh, that deliberate practice even has as big of a role that Erickson claimed that it did. Uh, and in uh, McNamara's case, there's a lot of other variabilities. So. Uh, what she looked at were different kinds of studies, lots of different studies, and then tried to calculate how much of the variance in performance is due to just uh, deliberate practice. Um, deliberate practice in this case, uh, how much performance is explained is shown in the light gray, uh, and then everything else, in other words, what's not explained by the number of hours of deliberate practice is shown in the dark gray. And you can see that for some domains, like chess, which she labeled as games and other kinds of games, uh, deliberate practice is really important. And if you've ever played chess or even other video games, you know that you've got to practice to get really good, right? Uh, you can't just be a good video game player uh, and automatically be able to master a new game. You've got to spend a lot of time practicing it. Same thing with chess, same thing with uh, other kinds of games. And she's found that this is true in music and sports as well, that at least around a quarter uh, or uh, a, f a fifth of the performance is explained by deliberate practice. But that also suggests that a lot isn't. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff like access to equipment, access to the time to do it, um, other kinds of preferences, or maybe individual differences, or personality styles, or other things like that, or perceptual dif uh, differences. Sports, for example, is where you start to see this relationship break down a little bit. Now, if any of you have ever played competitive uh, hockey or competitive soccer or competitive baseball or any other kind of competitive level sport, you know you've got to put in a lot of time to practice, right? Um, but that's not everything. Certainly within athletics, uh, there's a lot of room for individual preference, for access to specific coaches or programs, for money, right? So you've got to be able to have a certain amount of uh, income and time to be able to put in that kind of practice. And you've got to have specific uh, physical characteristics for some sports. Uh, some people are, uh, you know, by virtue of their size or their, uh, you know, lung capacities or anything else uh, related to the particular sport they're trying to excel in, are going to be better uh, than others, um, right? You know, 
a certain amount of height is uh, needed to play some sports, a certain amount of center of gravity might be needed to excel well in others, a certain amount of arm strength or upper body strength or leg strength might be needed to excel in other sports. Uh, we see this even uh, to be less, uh, less of a role for deliberate practice in education, like professors like me, um, and other kinds of professions like medicine or lawyers. The reason it seems to play uh, such a small role in education and professions, uh, like medical experts or uh, professors or scientists, uh, is that the practice is already a given for everyone. Right? If you want to become a, a surgeon, you have a certain trajectory you need to follow with a university education, med school, a fellowship, a residency, and so on. Uh, so everyone who gets to be a surgeon has gone through already uh, 10 to 12 years of training uh, and roughly the same number of hours. Medical residency is a long process of giving people a lot of time uh, in a clinic. Um, and so that seems to be regularized. And so the tendency to become an elite expert in one of these fields is almost always going to be something else because most people already have the same amount of expertise. Um, she found this tends to be true in sports. And as predicted, uh, it seems to be least of a role in the elite samples. In other words, at the Olympics level, uh, the amount of time that you're spent uh, uh, practicing doesn't really seem to contribute to who gets to the gold medal. Uh, what seems to contribute are likely physical characteristics, uh, mental and cognitive characteristics, personality characteristics. Um, because for Olympic athletes, uh, there's a lot of time, right? Everybody's spending a lot of time practicing and competing. And what seems to make the difference are sometimes just luck, uh, sometimes uh, uh, specific training regimens, uh, maybe the same amount of time, but you've trained in a slightly different way, uh, what you've eaten, uh, the uniform, what the uniform is made of, the specific coach that you have, an approach that you've taken. All of these things uh, account for the variance in elite samples much more than just the number of hours of deliberate practice. So what this suggests, um, and we're going to move on to the next topic here in just a minute, is that deliberate practice is very important. Uh, Erickson's work shows that. McNamara's work shows that. But it's an oversimplification to suggest uh, that it's the only thing that's needed. Uh, certainly, it's an oversimplification to suggest that 10,000 hours is uh, a sufficient characteristic. It's definitely not a rule. It's definitely not a magic number. Uh, lots of other things are important. And I think more than anything, McNamara's work suggests that there are other things beyond deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is important, but it's not the only thing. So once you become an expert, though, um, how do you do things differently? Uh, so we've talked about what an expert is, and we've talked about how you get to be an expert. Um, but once you're an expert, uh, what kind of performance do you show that's different from that of novices? Let's look at that next. Let's look at perception. Um, so we've talked a lot about how uh, people recognize objects, how we recognize objects at a basic level. Um, experts might see the world slightly differently than novices do. Um, because you have to learn the relevant perceptual features to do something, uh, and you've got to spend a lot of time doing it, um, it can be effective to perceive things uh, at a different level. Uh, and what Mervis and Roche, uh, two researchers, have found is that uh, experts seem to operate at a subordinate level. Remember back a few weeks ago when we talked about object recognition and knowledge structures and categorization, we suggested there's a basic level, right? And that's the level that we name things at, we recognize objects at, and it's also the level at which objects tend to have the same shape and the same uh, size and the same features. Uh, and so we give them a general name like bird, right? But suppose uh, you're an ornithologist or an expert birder. Uh, you like bird watching and you go out uh, many several times a week uh, and you spend time learning to identify birds in your backyard, you're going to get really good at identifying birds, right? You're not going to just call them all birds. You're going to learn to identify them by their species because that's what's important to you. That is your goal. And so whereas you and I, uh, if we're not birders, might look at all of these and say, look at all the birds. <laughs> uh, an expert birder would probably be able to identify each one of them uh, by their species uh, based on their simple perceptual characteristics. And the reason seems to be it's the goal that's in mind, right? If your goal is to get through life and to uh, identify objects at the basic level, which is true for most of us, for most of the things, then we're going to identify these as birds. Maybe, 
we will identify them as a slightly sub-basic level, like songbirds and uh, water birds, or songbirds and ducks, or something like that, uh, or songbirds and uh, hawks. You know, we might be able to identify those slightly below the basic level, uh, but when we see them, we're still going to say it's a bird. Whereas an expert, uh, what Mervis and Roche found, is that they operate instinctively at the subordinate level. They name them by species because that's the goal. That's what they've been practicing. Uh, that's what they've been spending time doing. And so that categorization seems to be uh, subordinately, dri subordinately driven and goal-driven. So I want to talk a little bit more about this idea of goal-driven or deep features or a recognition of some underlying uh, similarity or underlying categorization that moves beyond the basic level. In other words, experts show advantages if, it, if what they're being asked to do, whether it's perception or categorization or memorization, corresponds to their goals and their level of expertise. Let's look at two other examples. Let's look at uh, memory and then let's look at categorization. So one of the classic findings in uh, expertise has to do with expertise in chess. Uh, chess experts seem to have the ability to recall a lot of information about chess pieces on a board. And if you are in the middle of a game uh, and then removed all of the pieces, the expert could put them back where they belong. Whereas if you're not an expert, which I am not, uh, I would have no chance, right? I wouldn't know what was there because I wouldn't be able to encode it. My memory doesn't have the structure, the schema, uh, or the relevant cont contextual knowledge to be able to put the pieces back where they belong. An expert could do it. Um, so experts have memory for real board positions better than novices. Let's look at what that means. So here's a great example of how this idea works. Uh, this is not specifically from the um, Chase and Simon example, uh, but this is an example of uh, what I mean by uh, real board positions versus random positions. Panel A shows uh, chess positions uh, in uh, what we would consider to be uh, a, an actual game. Uh, so uh, this is from a real game, uh, and it's a game in progress, and you can see the positions. If you know anything about chess, uh, you know that these positions are where you might expect them to be. So you've got pawns for the white side down at the bottom there. You've got some uh, pawns for the uh, black color up at the top there. Uh, you've got the rooks, the castle-shaped ones where they belong. Uh, you'll notice that you've got the ones with a little white cross on them, the bishop pieces. Uh, you've got one on a a dark square, one on a light square. This is a game midway. Um, on the right-hand side is a set of the same number of pieces uh, on the same kind of a chess board, but in random positions. And if you know anything at all about chess, even as a novice, you would recognize that this would be impossible. Um, for example, the two uh, black bishops are both on dark squares. Would never possibly happen. Couldn't even set up a chess game that way. Uh, and if you look at some of the others, you'll see that there's no way this could ever occur uh, in a real game. It just wouldn't. Uh, there's no way for these positions. These are randomly placed. Now, if you're an expert chess player, or even a good chess player, you'd recognize on the left uh, that is possible. You'd recognize on the right that's impossible. But what if you're a really good chess player? You should recognize, because of the, num because of the way chess progresses, you should recognize that that's a game in process. And if you're an expert chess player and you've been playing chess uh, for, let's say, 10,000 hours. Uh, if you've been playing chess for 10,000 hours, you've probably played a game just like that. In fact, you've probably played several games that have almost exactly this configuration, uh, and you've probably studied games that have this kind of configuration. Uh, so what the researchers did uh, is they would show them these chess boards uh, for 10 seconds, uh, 10 seconds or less, and then disappears, and they were asked to reconstruct them from memory. Uh, and what you see on the bottom there uh, is a reconstructed chessboard on the right uh, to correspond with panel A. It's not perfect, but it's close. Um, and what you see on the um, what you see on the left there is um, the number of pieces correctly recalled um, on the y-axis, and the x-axis. Uh, shows the player rating. So player rating is how good you are. Grand masters, generally 2,500 or higher. Uh, these are people who are competitively playing for a living, and they probably spend 10,000 hours or more playing chess. And as the uh, figure shows, um, it the figure in uh, panel A is familiar to them because it corresponds to a famous game. 
uh, and it corresponds to a game that they've probably studied in their chess knowledge. What this means is that when it's a game position, um, the better your player rating, in other words, the higher your expertise, the more likely you are to be able to put the pieces on correctly after only seeing it for 10 seconds. That suggests that you know the answer already. In other words, you're not necessarily using perception and memory to identify each individual piece. What you're doing is you're recognizing the familiarity uh, with what you see on the screen for 10 seconds and how it corresponds to something you've seen before. In other words, it's activating prior chess memory from a game you've played or a game you've studied. That helps you chunk these pieces into larger chunks, uh, and it helps you retrieve the information from memory. You're not necessarily retrieving the information from what you've seen from memory. You're combining that with what you already know to help use your knowledge to recreate the board. The better your expertise, the better you are able to do that. Um, however, notice the line at the bottom there that says random. Experts, no matter how good they are, uh, don't really show much of an advantage uh, for uh, random positions, uh, whether it's the 1600 level or the um, close to 2500 uh, level. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much of an advantage. Uh, you can get two or three pieces right. In other words, when they see the panel uh, shown in figure B, uh, experts are pretty much about the same regardless of, le of their level of expertise. And other research has shown that they're pretty much the same as novices. Uh, this doesn't make any sense to an expert. Uh, this, for if you're not an expert in chess, imagine trying to uh, see a long string of uh, 20 different letters in a random order that don't correspond to a word. Probably wouldn't be able to get every 20 of them right, but if you saw 20 letters that corresponded to two words that you know, you'd be able to get them right. This is the same thing. That figure B uh, is as much uh, nonsense to a chess, a chess expert as it is to a chess novice. Uh, it's just a bunch of pieces that make no sense. Uh, and so they're trying to put it together. They're essentially novices at trying to recreate it. Experts show this advantage only for things that they're experts at. Let's look at two other examples. Uh, so expert level categorization. Experts seem to use these goal-oriented categories, these uh, things that we talked about with respect to um, uh, birds. So if your goal is to identify birds, you get good at identifying birds and you identify them at this subordinate level. If your goal is to solve problems, uh, then you recognize the solution to the problem and sort them and categorize them accordingly. It's a basic function of expertise and it depends on the kind of expertise. A classic study uh, carried out by Shee, Feltovich, and Glazer in the early 1980s really set the stage for this. I'm going to talk about two experiments. I'm going to talk about their experiment and then some research that one of my grad students did uh, a few years ago. Uh, so what she, Feltovich, and Glazer did is they took experts in physics, which for their purposes were physics PhD students, probably not the 10-year experts or maybe not the same kind of expert as a premier violin soloist or a uh, chess grandmaster, but physics PhD students are pretty good at basic physics. Um, and they compared them to novices who had taken one undergrad first-year physics course. Uh, what they asked them to do was to sort 24 physics problems based uh, into whatever categories they thought were appropriate on how to solve them. Uh, and what they found was that novices tended to categorize them on similar perceptual features, and experts tended to group them together based on the major physics principle that was needed to solve the problem. Here's some examples. So uh, here are uh, some examples from a uh, textbook, a basic textbook that they used at the time. So problem 1011 just corresponds to problem number 10 uh, in, uh, in the specific uh, chapter 10, problem number 11. Uh, so these go along with a specific uh, kind of uh, textbook that they used. Um, and there are different ways to group them together. Uh, on the left are shown the expert or the novice classifications. On the right are shown some expert classifications. Um, notice, uh, first of all, that uh, problem 10 and problem 11 are grouped together by novices, and they say things like uh, angular velocity, momentum, and circular things, uh, rotational things, uh, things with angles. And you can see that's clear, right? They both are a disk uh, with a line in between them. Problem seven and pro 23 and problem 735, novices put together. And they put them together because uh, they're both blocks on an inclined plane, and that's literally what they say. These deal with blocks on an inclined plane. 
uh, incline plane problems, coefficient of friction, blocks on inclined planes with angles. That's a literal description of what you can see there. Experts chose a different sorting. Um, what they suggested was that problem 621 uh, should be sorted with problem uh, 735. This is important because problem 735 is grouped differently by experts and novices. Novices grouped it with the other things that were blocks on inclined planes, whereas experts grouped it with things that required the work energy theorem or the conservation of energy. Uh, so they grouped it with problem 621, which is a block with a spring connected to it. Expert number three, number two says conservation of energy. Expert three says work energy theorem. They're straightforward problems. Uh, maybe for you. Uh, expert number four, uh, these can be done from energy considerations. Either you know the principle of conservation of energy or work is lost somewhere. So they're concerned with the underlying principle of physics. Those go together for an expert. Um, whereas novices... Uh, not as familiar with the underlying principles of physics, group them together based on their surface characteristics. And this result has shown and held up in lots of other studies. Uh, I want to talk about a uh, specific e example uh, that one of my graduate students uh, used a few years ago, uh, looking at medical experts and how they classify patients. So this was carried out by um, Sarah Devantier, who was a master's student in my lab uh, about 10 years ago, uh, along with uh, two physicians uh, at Schulich. Um, and what we were interested in was studying to see if this kind of expertise, in other words, this tendency to focus on solutions, uh, was present in uh, physicians. Uh, and our hypothesis was that expert physicians would be more likely to recognize deep features related to how to manage a patient in a disease for which management is a crucial goal uh, than novices or even intermediates. Uh, here's how we defined novice, intermediate, and expert. Uh, so our experts, these were people who were uh, expert uh, uh, endocrinologists. So these are people who had um, at least uh, 15 years of experience practicing at the hospital level uh, as endocrinologists. Uh, this means they had also completed undergrad med school, uh, residency, and the specialized fellowship that's necessary to become an endocrinologist. Um, we also looked at intermediates. These were students who were um, in, who had finished med school and were residents. Uh, so they have been spending two to four years on average in a hospital setting managing patients. They have not yet completed all of their rotations. They haven't completed their residency, and they haven't uh, taken on a fellowship in endocrinology. So they're good, but they're not at the level of the expert. And the novices were 15 uh, students through first uh, to fourth year med school, or sorry, second uh, to fourth year med school. So these are students currently, at the time, they were currently in Schulich. It's a small group, uh, but it's hard to get a large group of endocrinologists uh, to agree to do your study. Um, so Rather than having them sort problems, and believe me, we tried the sorting problem, but that took, was a little bit too time intensive uh, for the expert endocrinologist. So we developed an alternative to sorting, and that was a forced choice task. In a forced choice task, your job is always to see a target item and then the cho to choose which one of two things matches. And in every case, we had a target that could match to one possible match that was a surface feature match. In other words, it had a lot of characteristics on it that had a that were that had in common with the target, but things that weren't related to the underlying diagnosis or the management strategy that need to be needed to be used for that patient. So it was kind of like the blocks on an inclined plane. So it looked the same, but maybe you wouldn't solve them the same way. At the same time, uh, we had a deep feature match, which was one in which maybe they didn't always share surface characteristics, but they had to be managed in the same way. In other words, more like the uh, two different conservation of energy theorem problems. And our job, or the participant's job, was to select which one of those two was the best match. We didn't tell them about surface and deep. Uh, we just said, pick which one is the best match. Now, for this case, we focused exclusively on diabetes because we were using endocrinologists who had a lot of expertise in this area, but also um, with, with diabetes, most of the patients uh, that people were seeing in the clinic, uh, the diagnosis was already clear. So it wasn't that they were diagnosing them, 
with diabetes. They're helping them manage the complications of type 2 diabetes uh, or type 1 diabetes. So it has a management component. We were interested in knowing if this patient management uh, would be some kind of goal that experts would have knowledge in only if they had been seeing patients and managing them. Here's an example of a uh, management category. The target is Mrs. Davis, who's 75, type 2 diabetes for 10 years. There's retinopathy mentioned. Uh, she checks her sugars, uh, something about her medica medication, and uh, hypoglycemic uh, reactions. We've got two possible matches. One is uh, Mr. Harris, who is uh, 65, uh, type 2 widower with severe cr crippling rheumatoid arthritis, small joints, just diagnosed. Um, and then we've got Mrs. Martin, who's 74, uh, type 2 diabetes for eight years, um, and there's some renal failure, some retinopathy, uh, hypoglycemia, as mentioned, uh, and insulin. So these are all three realistic patient profiles. They're not real patients. These are just uh, made-up patients, but they're all realistic. Um, there are two possible matches. Um, one of the possible matches is a surface match. Uh, in other words, most of the things that are shared are surface-related, not necessarily related to how you manage. And one of the other matches is a management match, uh, and it's related to how you should manage the disease. Take a minute to see which one you would pick as the best possible match for the target. Now, if you were thinking possible match two is the best match, you would have made a surface match. And that's because uh, they're both older women, 74 and 75. They both had diabetes for eight and 10 years. Uh, retinopathy is mentioned. Um, uh, hypoglycemia is mentioned. Uh, and uh, different medication levels are mentioned. So there's no reason those patients wouldn't go together, but it's certainly based on the surface characteristics of what the patient is like. Possible match number one, if you chose that as the best possible match, you would have made a management-based deep feature match. Mr. Harris, uh, older man, not quite as old, um, he's a widower uh, and he's just been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Um, nothing is mentioned about retinopathy and being blind, but something is mentioned about crippling rheumatoid arthritis. And what a lot of our um, experts picked up on is that these two people, although they may seem a little less similar on the surface, they would need to have some management uh, that's the same. In other words, one of them is unable to check sugar levels, unable to self-administer insulin because of retinopathy, and the other would have the same kind of problem based on the rheumatoid arthritis. So although they're different on the surface, they would require a similar management strategy. And that's what we were expecting our uh, experts to pick up on if they've had some time uh, managing diabetes patients. So we put all of our experts, our intermediates, and our novices through a series of these uh, questions. Uh, some of them dealt with these management characteristics, and others, which I didn't show, uh, dealt with what we called a diagnostic uh, expertise uh, deep feature. In other words, something that was specific to the nature of the diabetes and the complications uh, that was not necessarily related to the management of the patient, but related to very specific expert level knowledge uh, that only, we assumed, that our uh, expert physicians who had completed this uh, rotation and fellowship in endocrinology would be able to assess. And that's essentially what we found. So looking overall, we saw that experts and intermediates tended to choose the deep feature match, in other words, the one that's related to expertise, more often than the novices did. So med school participants did not uh, tend to choose those deep feature matches. They made the match based on surface characteristics. If patients looked the same, they put them together. For management uh, trials, so any anytime the deep feature match was related to how to manage the patient, like the one that we just saw, um, experts and intermediates did quite well in picking that out. So the experts did it because they're experts. The intermediates, we reason, did it because they've been spending two or three years, many times, uh, many hours a week, uh, dealing with um, diabetes patients. So they're helping patients manage the disease. That's front, foremost, and center. That's fresh in their mind. They've seen patients in the clinic, and they're able to recognize uh, these management uh, categories. They're able to recognize this particular level of expertise, and so they choose uh, the expert level decision.
uh, whereas the novices who are second to fourth year med students, although they know about diabetes and they know about patients and they know about some of these complications, they haven't seen patients yet. Uh, so they haven't been doing it on their own as residents do. Uh, and so they're still uh, behaving like uh, novices. For some of the uh, other trials, though, ones for which the deep feature match was based on uh, very specific and high-level knowledge about how diabetes works from an endocrinological, endocrinological standpoint, only the expert uh, endocrinologists were able to uh, notice that. Uh, the novices uh, tended to not, uh, and the intermediates tended to look more like novices in this case. In other words, the expertise is something that develops over time. Uh, as a novice, uh, you don't have access to the information. As an intermediate, you have access to the management information because you're seeing patients and helping them. After you've completed the fellowship in endocrinology and practicing as an attending physician, as an endocrinologist, uh, you're able to access even deeper uh, encapsulated knowledge uh, and make those uh, connections that uh, even the intermediates aren't able to make. So let's summarize. Expertise, it's a complex phenomenon, of course. That's why they're experts. Uh, experts have dedicated time and deliberate practice to become good at what they do. Uh, it's around, on average, maybe 10,000 hours of getting to be an expert, but that's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, that's a, an average finding. Uh, but as a result, experts sometimes process information more effectively and in different ways than novices do.